Hey everybody, welcome back to the Tipsy Ghost. We are your tipsy hosts, Sarah, Sarah, and Lindsay. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? <laughs> Sorry. Neun. Oh, that's nine. Nine. <laughs> so confusing. Nine. Nine. Nine does not mean nine. No. It means no. Neun. It's like nine. noise. That's how I remember it. Noise. Mm -hmm. A forever. You'll hear in a next week's <laughs> episode that Sarah and I are learning languages. Yes. Uh, very rough. She's learning German. I'm learning... Norwegian and Lindsay is learning English. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Thank you. That was really good. Uh, photosynthesis. <laughs> wow. You must be in the advanced course. I am. I've been there for a long time. <laughs> Just a spoiler. We're doing a true crime episode tonight. Spoiler. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Let's, let's try it again. We're doing a true crime episode tonight. True, true crime. Oh, what the hell was that? <laughs> I went low. And then hi. Yeah. I wanted to meet you up. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I liked I, it quite a bit, actually. And I want. That's that you did. Have you been in choir here in the last couple of weeks? Yes. Oh, okay. That explains While it. While you guys are learning languages, I'm learning how to sing. Here we go. Voice lessons. <laughs> On Duolingo? No. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, so a true crime episode, I had a true crime question for you guys. Oh, okay. Okay. What would you do if you were home alone? Oh. Say you're in the kitchen and you hear a noise in the house. So it's like not like, oh, the toilet's running or, oh, it's just the pipes. It's like, oh, there is somebody in my house. I'm getting scream vibes in the kitchen. Am I by myself in the house, you said? You think so. You, I mean, like where my kids alone, are yes. not there. Okay. I'd go outside. Okay. I would... Probably grab my phone and go outside and be calling 911 at the same time. more details than I did. <laughs> I mean, I'd be calling 911 as I'm going outside. Okay. Hold on. It depends on where I hear the noise. If the noise is by, like, the oh doors, gosh. what am I going to do? No, it's just somewhere in your house. You're going to go big. outside. Like, say <laughs> it's in a room. Outside. Say it's yeah. in a, a room nearby. You're in the kitchen. It's in... My bedroom. Your bedroom. Yes. Then I will make it for the door. I have my exit strategies. Okay. This, <laughs> so, this happened to me recently. I thought I was alone in the house. Oh, Is it I, Walter? I come upstairs <laughs> and I'm just packing my lunch for the day, getting ready to go to work. I'm getting getting my day started and I'm in the kitchen and I hear this noise in our spare bedroom. And so I like freeze and I was like, what? What was that? There's somebody in the house. What was the noise? Describe it to me. It was the bed creaking. The spare oh. bed creaking. It's like it's Walter. got a really cheap base, and so it was like Walter getting freaky, <laughs> like somebody in the bed. <laughs> okay, all right. So I I freeze, and then I was like, "There's somebody in my house." And looking back on it, it's very surprising I did this, but I grab a large knife from the kitchen. <laughs> what? That is not what I would have imagined you would answer. You were to this main question. character vibes from a Same. horror movie. She's, she's final girl. <laughs> And I walk down the hallway to the spare bedroom, expecting to see like some stranger, I don't know, jumping on the bed or something. Yes, that's what they would do. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing, but I was expecting a stranger. Rolling. And okay. I like, I'm holding up the knife, like oh scream gosh. style, like I'm ready to impale you. And there Mike is just laying on the bed. He just rolled over and he just, he hears me come in and he's like, hey, honey. And I was like, I almost killed you with a kitchen knife. <laughs> Did you not think he was home? No, he wasn't supposed to be home. He didn't text me. He didn't let me know. I was minding my business and I heard a noise in the bedroom. Turns out it was him. Just <laughs> oh he my was, God. He was homesick and he was just rolling over in the spare bed. And oh, I geez. thought it was an intruder. Well. And I almost killed him with a knife. <laughs> Dude, the fact that you just picked up like a huge <laughs> <I'm> kitchen. <laughs> I yeah. ever tell you about how someone walked into my house once? No, that yeah. sounds terrifying. A stranger. So you're going to yell at me for this. Probably. Our garage door was open. <laughs> I just don't understand. It was in Wichita. So it was before we moved here. Um, and our garage door was open. And I was in the kitchen, which our garage door leads into the kitchen. And I was cooking dinner. And my kids were babies. They were little. Evan was home. And I hear the garage door open. And I thought, did he like go outside and come back in? And I turn around. And this guy is just standing there. <laughs> oh, my God. And he looks at me. Easy. And he freezes. And like Evan's in the living room watching TV with the kids. And he goes... 
can I help you? <laughs> and like gets up from the couch, you know, my six foot five husband gets up from the couch <laughs> and I'm like frozen. I'm like, this guy is between me and my husband. <laughs> There's no way out of this kitchen. Okay. And the guy goes, he like, just was like, I think I have the wrong house. And yeah. I think Evan goes, I think you do. <laughs> and he turned and like left and just walked right back out, shut the door behind him. And like, Evan and I just stared at each other and Evan goes, I'm going to make sure he leaves. And I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> And then did you shut your garage door? We did. Okay. So Evan like followed him out and made sure like he left and he just walked down the street like he didn't have a car or anything. And we thought, like we know our neighbors. He wasn't our neighbor. So we were like, is he visiting a neighbor? But he wasn't driving. He was just walking around. <laughs> what habit do you still have? <laughs> oh, I still keep my garage door open all the time when I'm home. I just don't understand. Hate it. Do it all the time. That's how people like that's I know I've explained it, but like my family, we don't knock on each other's doors we just go in and so they just come in through the garage door they know if the garage door is open i'm home you can come on in all right you ready to spin ready yep yay (laughs) (laughs) it's Lindsay. yay have you guys seen the new true crime on Netflix called Worst Roommate Ever. Yes, I have. We are going to talk about one of those cases. Yes. We're going to it talk about Dorothea Puente. Dorothea Puente. Yeah. Are you familiar? I have heard the name. Okay. Dorothea Helen Gray was born on January 9th, 1929 in the Redlands, California. She had a pretty traumatic upbringing. Um, her parents were both alcoholics, and her father repeatedly threatened to kill himself in front of the children. Her father did eventually die of tuberculosis in 1937, and her mother lost custody of them, them being like her and her siblings, uh, the next year in 1938, and then died in a motorcycle accident that same year. So, Jeez. Orphaned at a very young age. Um, Back then, they still had orphanages, so she and her siblings were sent to one, and she was sexually abused while there as well. Eventually, Dorothea married Fred McFall in 1945 at the age of 16. So he had just gotten back from World War II. They had two daughters. One was sent to live with relatives, and the other was placed for adoption, and they divorced in 1948, three years later. So Dorothea was arrested in 1948 for purchasing women's accessories using forged checks. She pled guilty to two counts of forgery and served four months in jail uh, with three years of probation afterwards. So 1952, she marries a seaman. I love Ahoy. semen. Ahoy. <laughs> Ahoy, semen. Ahoy, His semen. name was Axel Bren Johansson. Of course it was. She, Axel? Axel. I know, that's not like a name you would think of in the 50s, but she started calling herself, I'm going to totally butcher this, Tia Singola Neyardi, and claimed to be of Egyptian and Israel descent, and was a Muslim. Okay. Um, while Axel was at sea, she would invite men into the home and gambled away all of his money. Oh, no. She was a lonely sea woman. <laughs> <laughs> lonely without her semen. <laughs> so she was arrested in 1960 for owning and operating a brothel under the guise of a bookkeeping firm in Sacramento. She was sentenced to 90 days in jail. 1961, her husband, Mr. Axel, the seaman, had her committed to DeWitt State Hospital for drinking and suicide attempts. There, she was diagnosed as a pathological liar with an unstable personality. I'd say. All right, so they divorced in 1966, and she then used the name of Sharon Johansson, so still using his last name, and portrayed herself as a kind Christian woman. She became a caregiver and would provide young women with a safe place to stay from poverty and abuse, and she would not, like, charge them any money. She was just like, come on in and stay. 1968, she married Roberto Jose Puente. This is She keeps his last name the rest of her life. They separated, though, after 16 months due to domestic violence. And it did not say whether it was her or him. Hmm. So he fled to Mexico, so the divorce actually wasn't finalized until several years later in 1973 because they couldn't track him down. Hmm. So during this time, Dorothea, she is focused on running a boarding house in Sacramento, California. She presents herself as a place to help alcoholics, homeless individuals, people with mental illness, etc. She was holding AA meetings. She would help them sign up for Social Security benefits. She would be their payee, giving out free food every week to the community. I mean, she was... 
really doing some good things for the community. Right. She even changed her appearance to appear more elderly. She would wear vintage clothing and large grainy glasses and let her hair go gray. She was putting on a real show. She was. She lived on the top floor of this boarding house, and she would rent it out to people on the floors below her. She eventually met and married Pedro Angel Montalvo, but he left the marriage after one week. Oh, my gosh. Took a week. Yikes. So that's her fourth marriage, for those of you keeping track at home. Uh, 1978, she was charged and convicted of illegally cashing 34 state and federal checks that belonged to her tenants. She was given five years of probation in order to pay $4,000 in restitution. April 1982, 53-year-old Ruth Monroe is living with Dorothea in the upstairs apartment and died of an overdose of codeine and acetaminophen. Tylenol. Dorothea told police that Ruth was depressed because she had a husband who was terminally ill, so police ruled the death as a suicide. But police returned to her home after 74-year-old Malcolm McKenzie accused Dorothea of drugging and stealing from him. So she picked him up from a bar. Um, they got back to his place, and he started feeling pretty strange and soon became paralyzed and could not move and watched her steal from him. But then she left, like didn't harm him. So he reported it to the police. She also during this time was passing herself off as a medical doctor to take advantage of elderly women. So she would go to their house, do these house calls. She had no medical training whatsoever. She would drug them and then steal from them. Not cool. Not cool. So Ruth passed in April of 1982. August 18th of 1982, a few months later, Dorothea was convicted again of three theft charges and sentenced to five years in prison this time. I mean, she's been caught for theft charges many times. And so last time she just got probation this time, they're like, no, you're going to prison. She only served three of the five years and was released in 1985. While in prison, she began a relationship with a man named Everson Gilmouth on the outside. And he was a 77 year old retiree and he picked her up from jail. And they began their relationship. So November 1985, Dorothea hires a man named Ismael Flores to install some wood paneling in her apartment. She asked him very specifically to build a six foot by three foot by two foot box in exchange for $800 and a truck, which belonged to her boyfriend, Everson. That doesn't sound suspicious at all. A box? You need to be suspicious. Six by three by two. Sounds like a box to add a body. Body she, box. It's a body box. She also asked Flores to transport the sealed box to a storage depot, but instead they dumped the box on the riverbank on the side of a highway. That's the same. Flores. Bro. I feel like we need to talk to him. Yeah. Right? Don't build a body box. I feel like some box, flags should have gone up. <laughs> and then you lift this very heavy sealed body box and dump it on the side of the road. <laughs> So a few months later, January 1986, a fisherman finds the box by the river and calls the police. And inside, they find a badly decomposed and unidentifiable body of an elderly male inside. Now we know that it was Gilmouth, the boyfriend, but it took three years for them to identify the body. So Dorothea was continuing to collect his pension during this time and even was writing his family letters stating he was ill and could not contact them, but everything was fine. Um, She was very popular with social workers and with the community because she took on the toughest cases. So people who were abusive, people who were violent, drug addicts, etc. She collected their mail before they even saw it and then would pay herself the rest, like give them so much money, like as a payee would, and then pocket the rest for expenses to live with her. Parole agents, because many of her people who were living with her were on parole, And she was supposed to be on parole. (laughs) They visited her several times, like they said, 17 times, I believe, and had been ordered to stay away from the elderly and also to not handle any government checks because of her history. But they never once cited her for violating this, despite literally having tenants who were elderly living with her and she was handling all their money as a payee. Right. People got suspicious. That's my next line. (laughs) You don't say. (laughs) A homeless alcoholic known as Chief. So he worked for Dorothea as a handyman, and she started having him dig in the basement and cart soil away in a wheelbarrow. The basement at this time was covered with concrete slab, and Chief ended up disappearing. Which again, like a homeless individual disappearing, people aren't really paying attention to those kinds of people. I mean, that sounds terrible, but 
They aren't. They're easy to not notice they are missing. So November 11th, 1988, a couple years later, police asked about the disappearance of a tenant whose name was Alvaro Montoya. He was known as Bert. And he was a developmentally disabled man with schizophrenia. So huge props to his social worker. She reported him missing. Dorothea kept telling the social worker that he was visiting his family in Mexico, but the social worker was like, no, he's not. Like She was contacting the family and they had never seen him. Um, so she told Dorothea, look, I'm going to call the police if I don't have contact with him by this day. And she didn't have contact and she called the police. So the police on their visit this time noticed that there was some disturbed soil in the backyard and they started digging and found the body of another tenant, Leona Carpenter, who was 78 years old. So police eventually found seven bodies buried on the property. He was charged with nine murders. Everson Gilmouth, who was the boyfriend that was literally dumped on the side of the highway. Uh, Ruth Monroe, the very first one who died of the overdose. Leona Carpenter, 78. Um, Alvaro Gonzalez Montoya, Bert, he was 51. Dorothy Miller, age 64. I think I meant Benjamin, but I put Injamin. (laughs) (laughs) Injamin. I was like, that's an unusual name. Uh, He was 55. James Gallup, 63. Vera Faye Martin, 64. And Betty Palmer, 78. So most of the victims had been drugged until they overdosed. And they were then wrapped in bed sheets and plastic lining before being buried in the backyard. At first, police did not suspect her because she was like this upstanding pillar of the community and was this elderly old woman who was letting these people stay with her. Um, So she was being questioned at the station and she asked to leave to go buy a cup of coffee nearby. And they had nothing to pin on her, nothing to hold her. They were just asking questions. So they let her go. In the meantime, while she was getting this coffee, they found more and more bodies. And the police were like, immediately I knew that she fled. Which she did. She fled to Los Angeles and picked up an elderly male that she met at a bar there. But this man recognized her from the TV's news reports and called the police who then met her in L.A. and arrested her. Her trial began in October of 1992 and ended a year later with over 130 witnesses called by the prosecutor to testify against her. They testify that she put her tenants to sleep and would suffocate them and then hire convicts to dig holes in the yard for her. The defense had people from the community come in and talk about how she had helped them and all the work she had done in the community. They also had psychologists come in and talk about her abusive and traumatic upbringing and how that motivated her to help others. But they also reported that she had an evil side. So, like, psychologist is not really helping there. I guess she was traumatized and wants to help others, but she has an evil side. Yes. The jury deliberated for over a month and eventually found her guilty of only three murders. They were deadlocked 11 to 1 for conviction on all nine counts. But the holdout finally agreed to a conviction of two first-degree murder counts and one second-degree murder count. The other six murders, the jury was deadlocked, like I said, um, and the judge declared a mistrial when the jury said, look, further deliberations, we're not going to change our minds. Like we, it's been a month and they weren't changing. Yeah. So the judge declared it a mistrial, which means under the law, there could be no death penalty sought. Hmm. So they were going for the death penalty originally. Um, She was given life without the possibility of parole and incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California. She maintained her innocence until the day that she died and said that the boarders all died of natural causes. Then why bury them in your house? She had no excuse for that. Exactly. She had these bodies literally in her backyard. Yes. And was like, look, I just buried them, but I didn't kill them. (laughs) She died in prison on March 27th of 2011 from natural causes at the age of 82 years old. And fun fact, Ghost Adventures investigated the house due to reports of hauntings by the victims and Dorothea herself. How do you think I knew about it? Because you've seen the episode. I've seen both of the worst roommate ever and the Ghost Adventures. Yes, I have not seen the Ghost Adventures. I will say just to add to that, when they were when we were interviewing people from um, the worst roommate ever on Netflix. The people that actually entered into the house while they were doing the investigation made comments about how just overwhelmingly disgusting the house smelled. Yeah, it was real bad. um, Because they saw, like, they could tell once they lifted up carpets, et cetera, that there was just body fluids seeped down into the wood. It was a disgusting place. Yes. I've always heard that name. I don't think I knew the story behind it. Oh, here's another fun fact about that one I learned. Yes. That, you know, how most of the time when there's been several deaths associated with a house that they tear it down. 
Um, but they can't tear this one down because it's part of the historical society. So it'll stay there forever. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. That is Dorothea. Thank you. Dorothea. Dorothea, Dorothea Puente. I'm going to spin. Okay. She's the worst. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I keep forgetting yeah, it doesn't yeah. make noises. It's me. Yay. I received a book for Christmas. Actually, two books. It's the Serial Killer Encyclopedia, Volumes 1 and 2. And so I just decided I'm just going to pick a page and go with whoever's on that page. Oh, interesting. I like it. And I landed on, you guys are going to love this, the Taco Bell Strangler. I I absolutely love it. Bean burrito with sour cream, please. (laughs) That's Sarah's order. (laughs) Killer. This is my order. (laughs) That's what I said. (laughs) What's my order? You're like a cheesy, beefy burrito with extra cheese on the side. No. It's some beefy burrito with cheese on the side. Taco John's. It's just a supreme taco, but no sour cream. Supreme taco, no tomato, no lettuce. I knew the no tomato part. Okay. Speaking of Taco Bell, we're going to talk about the Taco Bell Strangler, also known as, a.k.a. Henry Louis Wallace. Okay. That's a lot of names, Henry Louis Wallace. The serial killers get three names. They do. Because Henry Wallace can be a really nice guy. Out of Wyoming. You're going to insult a Henry Louis Wallace? <laughs> the Henry Louis Wallace. Specifically talking about. the Taco Bell Strangler. Taco Bell Strangler. Got it. So this Wallace was born in 1965 in Barnwell, South Carolina. Are you familiar? I, I have been to South Carolina, not Barnwell, no. <laughs> You've been? <laughs> I, I've, I've been to the state. <laughs> His mother worked long hours as a textile worker and is said to have been a harsh disciplinarian, constantly criticizing him for even the smallest of mistakes. So he didn't have really a great upbringing. He was criticized constantly. He went to Barnwell High School, where he was a cheerleader and a member of the student council. He graduated in, in 1880. No. 1880? Taco Bell <laughs> oh was my around? God. Taco Bell, the OG. <laughs> 1983. It was a ghost Taco Bell killer. And then he became a DJ for a local radio station. Wow. A man of many trades. Taco Bell. <laughs> and DJ. DJ Taco Bell. Cheerleading. DJ Taco Bell. Student council. Listen, <laughs> he's busy. He's more involved than I ever was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He eventually joined the Navy in 1985 and wow. married his high school sweetheart, Moretta, that okay. same year. He kicks off his criminal career soon after joining the Navy, unfortunately. He began using several drugs and had warrants out for a string of burglaries in and around the Seattle metro area. Okay. In 1988, Wallace was arrested for breaking into a hardware store and sentenced to two years of supervised probation. But according to his probation officer, he didn't attend most of the meetings. Instead, he made his way back to South Carolina and in 1990 murdered 18-year-old Tashonda Bethea. A student at his alma mater. Aww. Sadly, he dumped her body in a lake where it wasn't discovered for several weeks. Um, He was questioned for her disappearance and then for her death, but was never formally charged with her murder. Around the same time, he was also questioned about the attempted rape of a 16-year-old girl, but was also never charged for that. It seems that he was getting away with some serious crimes, but his marriage had fallen apart and he was fired from his job as a chemical operator. So the next year in 1991, he broke into Barnwell High School and into the radio station where he used to work and he stole some very expensive equipment uh, and he was caught trying to pawn it. He then moved to Charlotte later that year and eventually became a manager at Taco Bell. Oh, I see. Okay. This is where the Taco Bell connection comes in. Charlotte, North Carolina. In 1992, Wallace was honorably discharged from the Navy, which is interesting because, as you heard, he had already killed somebody. Yeah. 
potentially he was still in the navy. Potentially raped another person, but he was honorably discharged. Interesting. Yeah. So in May of the same year, he picked up 33-year-old Sharon Nance who at the time was a convicted drug dealer and a known sex worker. And when she demanded payment for her services, he beat her to death and dropped her body by the railroad track where she was found a few days later. A few months after this, in June of the same year, he raped and strangled 20-year-old Caroline Love at her apartment and then dropped her body in a wooded area. She was a friend and roommate of Wallace's girlfriend at the time and was working at Bojangles, which I know Lindsay is familiar with. (laughs) I love Bojangles. Oh, I love me some Bojangles. We've talked about Bojangles. What is Bojangles? It's chicken. Bojangles is a fast food restaurant and it's chicken, kind of like KFC chicken and biscuits. And it's so good. They have really good breakfast. That's why I love their Bowberry. Oh, that's right. I hate that. Uh And their sweet (laughs) tea is so good. He went with his girlfriend and her sister to file a missing persons report soon after. But it was almost two years before her body was discovered. So... So he's one of the ones that filed the missing persons report. Mm-hmm. Which a lot of Yucky. times they say that they stay, like to stay close to the investigation. Yeah. Yes. February 19th, 1993, he strangled 20-year-old Shauna Hawk at her home after raping her. He later attended her funeral. Oh, yeah. There it is. She had worked at Taco Bell, where Wallace was her supervisor. Oh, no. She was also in college, studying to become a paralegal. Her mother and godmother actually formed a Charlotte-based support group for parents of murdered children. Very cool. A few months after Shauna was murdered on June 22nd, Wallace raped and strangled in another co-worker from Taco Bell, 24-year-old Audrey Spain. Her body was found two days later, August 10th of 93. He raped and strangled 21-year-old Valencia Jumper. She was a college student and a friend of his sister. He set her apartment on fire to cover up his crime, and a few days later, after the murder, he also attended her funeral with his sister. How are they not seeing all these missing women from the same employment place? Well, we'll get to that. (laughs) Not connecting the dots. Something's weird. Listen, there's three women who've been killed from this Taco Bell. Yeah. So just a month after this, in September, he went to the apartment of 20-year-old Michelle Stinson, who was an ambitious college student, a single mother of two, young children, and a friend of his from Taco Bell. He raped her and then later strangled her in front of her oldest son. Oh, gosh. Early in 1994, he was arrested for shoplifting, but at the point, the police had not really connected him with the murders, and he was quickly let go. Um, just a couple of weeks later, though, on February 20th, 1994, Wallace raped and strangled 25-year-old Vanessa Little Mac in her apartment. So he knew Vanessa through her sister, who worked with him at Taco Bell. And she worked at a local hospital and had two daughters. March 8th, 1994, Wallace robbed, raped, and strangled 24-year-old Betty Jean Balcom. And it was the day after her birthday. She and Wallace's girlfriend were co-workers at Bojangles. And he had taken quite a few valuables from the house and he had also taken her car. He pawned the belongings and then parked the car at the shopping center across the street from the, the lake apartments. Wallace went back to the same apartment complex that night where, and that's where his friend, 18 year old Brandy Henderson lived with her infant son. He went in, he raped her while she held the, the baby and then he strangled her. He also tried to strangle her son, but the, the, the child survived. He took off with some valuables, tried to pawn them as well. So with two bodies from the same apartment complex, police increased their patrols. Yet still, Wallace was able to sneak through 
to, uh, in the same location, 35-year-old Deborah Slaughter, who was another co-worker of his girlfriend from Bojangles. She had just relocated for, uh, to Charlotte from Atlanta with her 18-year-old son. He raped, strangled, and then stabbed her almost 40 times Jeez. in the stomach and the chest. He then robbed her to purchase drugs, as he had done previously. And five days later, on March 13th, 1994, he was arrested. Finally. He (sighs) eventually confessed to the murder of only 10 of the women in Charlotte, but also the 11th in uh, his hometown. He was able to describe in detail how the women looked, how he committed each crime, and their relation to his crack cocaine habit. So while the arrest brought a lot of relief to the city that was kind of living in fear at this point, there was also confusion and anger. So those close to Wallace were surprised that he was the murderer. He knew almost all of his victims and he had mutual friends who didn't even consider him as a possibility as a suspect. The victim's families, however, were very angry. So not just with Wallace for murdering their family members as would be expected, but also with the police for what they perceived as a neglectful investigation into the deaths of black women. All of his victims are black. He is also black. Um, The police chief said that they didn't realize that they had a serial killer until Wallace escalated and murdered more closely together in time. So his murder span across approximately five years. And it wasn't until he murdered with a, a span of weeks that they connected that they had a serial killer. Hmm. The department apologized for not spotting the link sooner and said that the circumstances varied just enough that it threw them off the trail. It was further hindered due to a limited number of detectives handling a then unprecedented number of homicides. And so with the high number of cases came an ever increasing amount of evidence and Another downside, unfortunately, we would later find out that Wallace raped his victims and then redressed them to throw off the idea of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So hopefully a rape kit would never be completed. As it turns out, though, a rape kit was completed on several occasions, but it got lost in the backlog of evidence. Mm -hmm. So the connection was never made. The department has since added many more homicide detectives to their staff and even built a whole new crime lab to go through all of the evidence that comes in. And as for the trial, the prosecution argued for the death penalty, of course. Um, The defense, though, asked for life without parole, claiming he suffered from mental illness due to the alleged physical and mental abuse. Mental. (laughs) Mental. (laughs) Makes sense. Uh, Mental abuse at the hands of his mother. So way back in the day, blaming it on mom. On January 7th, 1997, Wallace was found guilty of nine murders and later was sentenced to nine death sentences. Wow. Afterwards, he made a statement to his victims' families and said, quote, None of these women, none of your daughters, mothers, sisters, or family members in any way deserved what they got. They did nothing to me that warranted their death, end quote. So Wallace goes to prison where he would meet and marry his wife, who was a former prison nurse. Oh my gosh. Rebecca. In a ceremony that occurred next to the execution chamber where he has been sentenced to die. Wallace has appealed the sentence several times and has been rejected each time. And to this day, he remains on death row. Oh. And that's the Taco Bell Strangler. He's a real piece of work, that one. Yeah. I sounds can't believe terrible. We've never heard of him. All right. Well, I'm going to finish us up. November 14th to... Th- nope. <laughs> now you talked it up. <laughs> Hang on. What's your story about? I'm going to tell you. She's going to give us a timeline first. We're setting the mood. I'm setting the stage here. (laughs) No, I said mood. Okay. (laughs) That was weird. I was close. Okay. November 15th, 2004, police were called to the home of Peter and Joan Porco. (laughs) Peter Porco picked a pipe of pickled pepper (laughs) porcas. 
Okay. I'm going to start over in there. Peter Porca. <laughs> no, Peter Porca. Yes, porcas. 2004 police were called to the home of Peter and Joan Porco. Peter was 52 years old at the time, and he worked as a court clerk. Joan was a children's speech pathologist. <laughs> Police found Peter face down in the entryway, but we'll get to him more here in just a minute. So hang on. His wife, Joan Porco, was found in their bed, completely covered in blood and suffering from major head trauma. Her facial wounds were so severe that primar- primarily pr- pr- preliminary paramedics. Paramedics. <laughs> I was trying to get what you're Pimerics. saying. You're doing great. Paramedics weren't sure where her mouth was when they were trying to put an oxygen mask onto her face. I know. Here's a good part, though. Joan actually survives the attack. Wow. But she ended up losing an eye and has, like, severe Mm. facial disfigurement Mm. now. Mm -mm. So why was Peter downstairs and Joan was still in bed, you might ask? Why? I'm going to tell you. Okay. They figured it out pretty quick that both of them had been attacked in their bed and left for dead by whoever attacked them. Peter had been struck in the head and face with an axe 16 times, but he got up and started walking around doing daily chores as if nothing happened. Oh, I thought like he tried to go get help. No, no, he did. He was unaware. All right. He used the bathroom. He went downstairs to the kitchen, loaded the dishwasher, packed up his lunch, went outside to get the newspaper, but the door locked behind him and he was able to find the spare key like under a plant, unlock the front door. And once he was inside the front door, he collapsed into the entryway and eventually died from blood loss. Um, so basically he was a walking dead body and functioning on only adrenaline at that time. Like autopilot pretty much <laughs> mm-hmm. too. So I found that oddly fascinating because, yeah. you know, technically she, he should have died in the bed. Um, but it turns out the injury damaged his neocortex in his brain, which controls reasoning, but left the paleocortex intact, which guides second nature habits, which explains why he was up walking around doing things that were routine for him, but still was unaware of what was actually going on with his physical body. I'll say it again. The brain is fascinating. Isn't it weird? It's fascinating. Yeah. They could find this blood trail everywhere in the house. Like, they could see exactly where he had gone. But I'm like, you're telling me he got his head bashed in with an axe and he loaded the dishwasher? 16 times. What? That's insane. Okay. Rather than call for help. Yeah, because he wasn't thinking yeah. like that. Fascinating. Okay. Police uh, found an axe in the couple's bedroom and they realized that this was used in the attack. Yeah. Officials began an investigation into the murder of Peter Porco and honed in pretty quickly on their son, Christopher. Mm. They immediately found, um, focused on their two sons, actually, but Christopher being the main focus. It was Jonathan and Christopher, but again, Christopher was the one they were looking at more intensely because they had kind of a rough relationship with him. Both of the the sons claimed to have alibis for the night of the murder, and Jonathan's checked out. He was across the country. He was nowhere close. And so he was ruled out pretty quick. Christopher, however, he was pretty sketchy. He said that he was at school at the University of Rochester, which was 230 miles away. Is that how you say that, Rochester? Yeah, New York. Uh, Christopher said that he learned about the attack from a reporter and had no idea what had happened. So he returned to Del Mar, where his parents were from. That evening, they learned that Christopher had a history of antisocial behavior. They also found out that he broke into his parents' house in July 2003 and stole several items, including two laptop computers and a camera. He then sold one of the laptops on eBay. He's just like got a lot of string of bad behavior. It was revealed during trial to later on that the alarm system in the Porco family home was disabled using their family secret code and only uh, they knew it. Yeah. Just a few hours later, the telephone line was cut and the keypad for the alarm system was destroyed. The prosecution thought that Christopher broke into the house, disabled the alarm, killed his parents, then cut the phone line and destroyed the keypad to make it look like a burglary. He thought that by destroying the alarm that there would be no evidence that he used the code to disable it first, but he was outsmarted by the alarm system. It showed that he used the code. 
Hmm. There were several emails uh, between Christopher and both of his parents that clearly demonstrate a very tumultuous relationship. Joan sent a few to him about his failing grades. In one of them, she said, you did it again. He basically <laughs> replied, blaming it on everybody else, saying that it wasn't actually his fault he was failing, and there was a misunderstanding between him and the teachers, and of course, nothing is ever his fault. Um, he also took out loans for school and um, ended up using some of that money on a new yellow Jeep Wrangler, and he forged his father's name as a co-signer to take out all this money. Mm. Two weeks before his murder, Peter confronted Christopher about the forged signature, and he was obviously pretty pissed about this, and told Christopher that he was going to call the banks and tell them that he was not a co-signer on these loans. He also said that if Christopher does anything like that again, quote, I will be forced to file forgery affidavits in order to disclaim liability. We may be disappointed with you, but your mother and I still love you and care about your future. No, it's very sad, actually. It's sad. So back to the night of the murder, Christopher told investigators that he was in his dorm asleep. The police thought that was a lie. <laughs> they determined that was a fly. <laughs> and then <laughs> it's an old joke. Look at us. <laughs> It's a long time ago. Uh, okay. They think, you know, he actually drove to his home, his parents' home. So, all right. So they asked the toll collectors if they remembered seeing a yellow Jeep Wrangler. And one of them said, yeah, oh, I do remember one speeding through and kind of stopping abruptly. It really, like, yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh, uh, it stands out. That's what I was trying to think yeah. of a good way to say that. A smarter way. That's all I can come up with. <laughs> it's he stuck ostentatious. Out. Oh, oh. <laughs> is that it? Never would I have used that word in that sentence, <laughs> but you. I think I will from yes. here on out. Thank you. <laughs> did you learn that on Duolingo? From your English? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, it turns out that four different security cameras at the University of Rochester campus recorded a yellow Jeep Wrangler leaving campus at 10.30 p.m. and returning at 8.30 a.m. Yep. Busted. Uh huh. They were able to narrow down the time frame when he would have been traveling through the toll booth and collect the tickets during oh, wow. that time frame. They then ran them through um, testing to check for DNA left by epithelial cells from his fingers that were sweating onto the ticket. What's epithelial? It's just a different. It's a type of skin cell. Okay. So you know, instead of doing blood gotcha. testing, they did it from skin cell testing. Okay. Um, and they found a match to his epithelial cell DNA. Interesting. A neighbor also happened to testify that they saw the yellow Jeep in the driveway the night of the attack. If you're going to be a, a dumbass, drive a yellow Jeep? Question mark? Why? No. Yeah. Why? And like also <laughs> security <laughs> cameras are reasons? literally everywhere. I know. They're all over campus. All right. Well, students from the university, they also testified that they never saw him at the dorm that night. A detective stated that while medical personnel tried to work on Joan and get her to the hospital, um, they asked her if a family member committed the crime, and she clearly nodded yes, because she couldn't speak. Right. She nodded. Um, when he asked if it was Jonathan, she shook her head no. And then when they asked if it was Christopher, she also clearly nodded again yes. Aww. Yes. So it gets even weirder because three weeks after her attack, Joan Porco woke up for her, from her medically induced coma and stated that she was not able to remember the attack and was adamant that Christopher was not involved. I mean, she probably had severe brain damage. I know. I know. And also wanting to protect your son. For sure. Yeah. Several months later, she even wrote to the Albany Times Union, I'm guessing that's a newspaper, sure. and urged authorities to leave her son alone and focus on finding the real killers. The defense arguments, there were no fingerprints found on the axe. They also said that the police immediately went after Christopher without any evidence to suggest that he was involved, at least right in the beginning. They kind of just like, their way of describing it was like, in this part, in, in this town, um, if you do something wrong at the 7-Eleven, they're going to immediately get you in trouble. So, like, you can't get away with anything there. And they kind of hone in on the kids who were labeled bad really early. But also, That's the way I they feel described like it. most homicides, we know this now, are committed by people we know. Right. So, of course, you're going to look at the next of kin. You're going to look at the family. Right. Yeah. And then, like, when you look at the keypad and you know that I mean, he knows where up. the axe is in the house because it was their axe. Right. It was a fireman's axe. So, yeah, all the things kind of add up and point directly at him. But, I mean, I guess I could see why they were like, well, they just picked him out right in the beginning without any evidence. And then they really didn't look for anybody else. I don't know. 
So on August 10th, 2006, Christopher Porco was found guilty of second degree murder and attempted murder of his mother, Joan. And December 12th, 2006, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Oh, wow. And he is currently at the Clinton Correctional Facility. Did he ever say, like, what his motive was? He has never admitted to anything. Wow. Yep. He still claims his innocence, and his mom still claims his innocence, and it has a very close, tight-knit relationship with him. I wonder what the other brother says. I think that they had kind of a rough relationship anyways between the brothers. Yeah. Um, So I'm not really sure that it changed a whole lot, to be honest with you. I just thought it was interesting because before he went to trial, he actually lived with his mom and, you know, things were just going on as normal and they were with each other constantly. So I don't know. That's sad. Very. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in this week to our true crime episode. You can always find us at thetipsyghost.com and find our socials from there or send us an email at thetipsyghost at gmail.com. Please also give us a five-star rating review wherever you listen to podcasts or on Apple Podcasts. It really does help, and we really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, guys. We will catch you next week. Okay, bye. Bye.